welcome back tonight. Thank you, first of all, for coming back and for round two. I see many people that were here this morning back tonight. That means that's encouraging to the pastor. I know you're back here tonight, so thank you so much for being here. And we're trusting God for a good evening together again. We want to uh, just give a few announcements. Please stay in your car if you could, please. And also, uh, there's really no... We don't want to have people go to the restroom in and out of your cars for that. If you need to have an emergency, you're welcome to do that. Just see one of the guys in the vest to help you inside and so forth. If you have to make an emergency, stop there. Okay? We will have an offering at the uh, part way through the service, not very far from now. So be thinking about that if you're prepared to give. And we want to be a blessing to the evangelist tonight, of course, in that way. And uh, let's uh, have a song. We'll sing some other cars in tonight. Let's check once you come. All right, let's sing Love Lifted Me. How many know that song? I thought so. <laughs> Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin. second revival service for today a drive-in revival service and this is the emphasis today is on revival i think god and his uh, uh, providence has been working on us before we got to this meeting uh, in the virus corona situation and coronavirus situation keeping us at stopping our tracks and he's working on us we want this meeting here today to be a meeting where god is going to work on us again and teach us some things from His Word. And I pray that, that the Holy Spirit will feel freedom tonight in your car, in your heart, to speak to you about uh, maybe a sin in your life, maybe getting right with the Lord in some area, 
to, uh, to live again in some ways. And God wants you to live again, revival. And so I'm praying that God speak to my heart. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. And ask God to speak to your heart in this service here in our parking lot. So let's bow our hearts and heads tonight. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we enter again, God, into this meeting. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our personal lives, in our families, in our nation. And God, what you want to do in our lives, and we need your help desperately. I pray that, God, you would help us in this meeting as we think about uh, what you're going to do. Be with our uh, evangelist tonight, Brother Knickerbocker. Please, Lord, give him liberty, give him strength. God, use him, God, as he opens the Word of God. And Holy Spirit, please do a work in our lives. Only you can do. And grant us, Lord, your work, your revival spirit in our place. Help us to take key, Lord, to our spirit tonight. As you speak to us about things that we're not doing right. Things we need to make changes about. We pray that you would, Lord, give us this spirit of revival in our hearts, I pray. Be the singing. Both songs are going to be sung tonight. Please use both of them in our lives to help us prepare our hearts for the message. And so we just pray right now for help and strength for this meeting. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing What a Day That Will Be. Does everybody know that one? Yeah. Not as many, but I will, I bet you remember it. <laughs> speakers out and just having the music prepared for us and God just gifted the hymn to us just in the nick of time didn't he to help us in so many areas we thank God for Brother Chuck and Miss Donna and the faithfulness of the church here what a great great blessing they've been 
I want to ask the ushers to make their way and grab their bucket. And also, there, um, we have a special Galilean news sheet of paper here. If you didn't get one this morning, I want to make sure you have one tonight. So when they go around and uh, take the offering tonight, just stick your hand out if you need one of those Galilean news announcement sheets. And of course, uh, Wednesday night, my son Matthew is going to be doing a Bible study. And he's going to try to do it Facebook Live or on the website or on YouTube to be there. And so I think he's going to continue his study of the book of Luke, uh, book, of, book of Ruth. And a great Bible study. He's a great Bible teacher. And I know you'll be helped if you'll tune into that on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Just put that on your calendar. And get used to that 7 o'clock time on Wednesday again. And try your best to tune into that. On Saturday, all the men and I are going to come together on the church here. We're going to have a little uh, breakfast time with Chick-fil-A. We're going to have some fellowship, some prayer, uh, talk about some organizational things we need to work on as a church, and just have a good prayer meeting. We're going to band together as brothers and pray together and ask God to give us wisdom as we try to reopen our church and do some things and, and trust God for wisdom about all of that. But also we're going to spend a little time delivering yard work. All I want to do is just a few bushes we're going to trim down and just spend about an hour just in the church parking lot area, just make it a little better. Just kind of bring in some fellowship together with us. That's on Saturday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock for breakfast and prayer. And just a time of fellowship. And we'll be done by 11 o'clock, if not earlier. So if you can come out, men, I'd appreciate your help and that effort there. Okay, the next Sunday we will have another drive-in service like this. I'll let you know the times we'll have that. And just keep in tune with us. We'll try to connect with you as those things come about. It's time now to give. And I want to encourage you to give. Think about being faithful in your tithes and offerings and you have a normal amount that you give from your paycheck that you have that you receive and so forth. Be faithful in those type things. Uh, recently, because of this uh, been away from the church and the lack of emphasis on missions, we're coming up short in our mission giving for this month. And so be thinking about that. If you haven't given your mission offering or you never have given toward that in a separate above your tithes and offerings, I want you to consider doing that, especially during this time. Don't put your tithes and offerings in the missions, or tithe, but put your mission giving there. Be faithful in that area and ask God to help you to give toward that. Because we want to make sure our missionaries are getting the, um, the support they need financially during this uh, lack of services and so forth. Be faithful in that. And then some folks are already still giving toward our bus fund. And that's uh, also on this Galilean News. It lets you know the update toward that. So thank you so much for being faithful in your giving. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask God's blessing on the offer. Good Chuck, would you pray? Dear Lord, we come in today. We just thank you for this time that we can come together as a drive-in church. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to meet again, even if it's in this manner, that we can still fellowship and have a good time together as a church. Pray that you be at the offering. Use it to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me just a moment. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true
darkness from me. to me with new assurance more and more I understand his words of love but I'll never know just why he came to say His blessed face above. Sing it with me. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind. to have um, Brother Dan here with us today. Miss, Miss Donna's going to make her way up here. Her husband's going to chat about there. Look at there. And uh, Evangelist Dan Knickerbocker has been an evangelist for a long, long time. He is someone, I believe, who lives in the state of revival. Uh, he mentioned something this morning about Apostle Paul. He, he, how he made a statement, follow me as I follow Christ. And uh, Apostle Paul wanted his walk to match his talk. And uh, this is what we have in our preacher tonight. If you ever around him, he lives in the joy of the Lord. And uh, the joy of the Lord is someone is rejoicing. They're experiencing revival. And uh, I want you to have your heart open and uh, your Bible ready uh, to hear someone preach about revival and have a Bible message. And I'm uh, trusting God to work in my life and in our church family's life as well. Miss Donna has a special song that she wants to sing for us tonight. You'll be praying for her and it'll be a blessing to your heart. God 
God's creation has a need to be wanted and loved, longing to be in the arms of the Father in our heavenly home up above. So God made a way to redeem you and I by sending his only son to Pastor, to come and appreciate your friendship and enjoy your family and enjoy the church. And uh, we're thankful so much for all that God has done and will do in the coming weeks and in the coming months as we take the time to worship the Lord. This morning I talked about uh, receiving, uh, uh, learning and receiving, and then watching, and then uh, doing those things that God desires for us. That's the answer that we need if we want to see revival in our lifetime. I have a book coming out here. It's coming out this next week. I should be receiving it on revival in our lifetime. It's a total of 10 messages with 43 personal illustrations of God working and moving in our midst. And I, I am convinced that God could send revival again. How about you? Amen. We certainly need to see a touch from God. We need to see a revival in our lifetime. And I am praying for it. But this evening what I want to do is I want to take you on a journey of what we call the downward steps that bring a person's life to spiritual ruin. You say, oh, Brother Knickerbocker, that sounds like such a uh, uh, terrible, depressing message. I think you'll find it very interesting because people do get backslidden. People do get away from God. And I've done a lot of thinking about this coronavirus and what the ultimate end of it is going to be. 
We have the before Corona. We have in the Corona. And then we have after. And those three things are going to determine the condition of the Christian life. And it's interesting to me that before Corona, there were many that were very apathetic to the things of God. And we're going to see how that works and how it has worked. We need a revival in our country. Would you agree to that? We really need God to move in a mighty way. But we've got to understand how the devil works as well as how the Lord works. And I shared with you this morning the steps that bring revival to the believer and to the family and to the church. I want you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Ezekiel. And I really want you to get a pen out and I want you to underline some things as we go through this message. Five simple points that will help us to understand what takes people away from God. I've thought about this a lot in the last month with everything changing so drastically. When it comes the first Sunday that Galilee and Baptist Church can meet again without any restriction, when it comes to that point, will the church be filled or will there be just the faithful few? That's a scary question, isn't it? I'd like to be able to see it filled, wouldn't you? I'd like to be able to see many people coming out to where not only is the parking lot full, but the, the church building is filled. God can do that, I believe He can. I want you to notice in my text, look with me there at chapter 18 of Ezekiel. In verse 2 it says, What meaneth ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Notice this saying. I'd like you to underline it. The fathers were have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Have you ever eaten a sour grape? <laughs> When we call that our teeth on edge, the fathers ate the sour grapes. Apparently they didn't have the right attitude in life and it caused their children's teeth to be set on edge. It's an illustration of how that wrong leadership brings about a disgust for spiritual things. A hypocrite, the Bible says, with his mouth destroys his neighbor. So, we understand the setting here that Ezekiel is wanting people to repent and to turn from their sourness and their teeth set on edge to the point where they love, honor, and serve the Lord again. Notice the verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And notice this little phrase, the soul that sinneth it shall die. If you'll notice also up in 13, verse 13, hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these what? Abominations. He shall surely what? He shall surely die. Notice also in verse 17, he shall surely live. So there's those that live and then there's those that die. If you get on to verse 19, Yea, say ye, why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the fathers? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely what? Live. Then go down to verse 21, he shall surely live. In verse 22, all his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall what? Live. So it's either life or death. It's either heaven or hell. It's either bitterness or joy. So you see what's happening here in this passage of Scripture. Then if you'll go with me over to verse 24. 
But when the righteous turn, turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and I just want to mention here that that person made the decision. The righteous made the decision to turn from his righteousness. And then look at verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his what? To his ways, saith the Lord. Then he says, repent and turn yourselves. If a person could turn from righteousness to unrighteousness, he could turn from unrighteousness to righteousness. So there's a there's a, 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 per, a position that God puts us in where we must do the turning. We must either turn from righteousness to unrighteousness or from unrighteousness to righteousness. Look at verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and do what? Live. Now that's my introduction. Now take your Bibles and go to the book of Hebrews, would you? Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. I would like you to go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, I want you to notice, I'm going to give you five steps that people take that go from righteousness to unrighteousness. Now these are very subtle steps. Many of you have taken these steps in your life. They've taken you away from revival. The first one, I want you to write down each of these steps. Number one, the word drifting. The word drifting. Notice with me in verse 1. That's Hebrews 2 verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them, notice the word, slip. Notice now, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The word drifting is a word that comes from this word slip. Have you ever slipped? Have you ever fallen down? It was kind of unexpected, but it happened almost before you realized it. The Bible says in this verse that that any time we should let them slip. That we, we make the decision to begin drifting from the Lord. Slip means to drift away from or lose footing. Beginning to lose control in your life. To be led out of the way into danger. The Bible says in verse 2 that every disobedience will receive a just recompense. Wheresoever whatsoever a man soweth, the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, he shall also reap what we sow, we're going to reap. Isn't it interesting that we can drift away from spiritual things? Remember when you used to walk with God every day, you spent time in His Word, you couldn't wait. You longed to be with Him, but then you started slipping in your Worship to the Lord. It's so easy to do. We have been living, it's interesting, in this coronavirus, everything has kind of slowed down, hasn't it? We're home a lot. And uh, why? Why shouldn't we get back to, uh, from drifting and get to the place where we stop slipping up and stay very faithful to the things of God? The second word we see is the word doubting. Take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. 
Before a person can ever start doubting God and doubting the things of God, they have to start drifting. Have you ever noticed, I remember, Pastor, I had a family in my church. It was a fellow in my church. He used to sit on the front row. Man, he had his Bible up on the pew in front of him there. He was in the second row, really, and he put his Bible on the pew in front of him. He had a notebook with his pen open and ready to go. For months, for a few years, he couldn't wait to get to church and study the Word of God. He loved it. He marked up his Bible. He wrote down notes. He was connected. But then he met somebody that took him away from the Lord. It was a high school sweetheart that came along and kind of stole his heart. He started moving back toward the back of the church and before long, he quit coming. He willingly did something that he shouldn't have done. He started doubting. He became hard in his heart and became disbelieving. You know, when you believe something with all your heart, you don't change. Unless it's a change for good and for better. But a doubting is found in verse 7 of chapter 3. Notice with me, it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today if ye will hear his voice, notice the next four verse, Harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. In the day of the temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. That's what we call doubting. Have you ever doubted the truth of God's Word? I remember a number of times as a pastor, people would come to me and say, I, I think I'm, I'm uh, going to leave the church and I, I, I'm not getting fed. And, and uh, really what was happening was they, were, they had hardened their heart toward the preaching of the Word to where they had to find an excuse to leave and they didn't want to be the excuse. So they gave the excuse to the pastor. How convenient. But these people often quit going to church. They quit living for the Lord. They really lost their, their strong spiritual testimony because they doubted and started living in unbelief. They didn't take God's word seriously anymore. And when you get to the place where you start doubting God... That's a dangerous place to be. The Bible says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are ye, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. If you have a weak faith, if you have a doubting spirit, you are falling. You are not falling from salvation, but you are falling from his favor. You're falling from the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. The Bible says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Oh, it's so important that we not begin to doubt the things of God. You know, some people may be mad at God right now because of the coronavirus. I look at it as a way to get closer to God, not further from God. But people's faith isn't that strong. And when people are doubting, they're going, boy, God must be mad at us. No, he's trying to bring us to the end of ourselves, to where we start saying, oh God, I've gotten cold on you. I, I, I've allowed myself to let the things of this world so entertain me that I am now doubting your own words that you gave to me. That's a dangerous place to be. Number three. The third thing I want you to write down is the word dullness. Dullness. And I want you to look with me in chapter 5 of Hebrews. Turn with me to chapter 5 of Hebrews. A dullness. I want you to notice there in chapter 5. Look with, look with me there at verse, ele uh, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, 
seeing that ye are, read it with me, dull of hearing. For when for the time we ought to be teachers, did you know what you've learned about God has come to you by the teacher of the Holy Spirit of God and by those that love you and care for you? It says, but when for the time we ought to be teachers, that means we've grown up spiritually to the point now where we are teaching others also. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. We're teaching others also. We're, we're now discipling and helping people to get closer to the Lord. But notice they became dull of hearing. For when, for the time we ought to be teachers, we have need that one teach us again. Notice, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong, strong meat belongeth to them that are of a full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Wow! Think what happens when a person becomes dull of hearing. They become sluggish in their spiritual life. They're not listening anymore. Have you ever told your child something and you thought they heard you and later you said, did you hear what I said? And they said, no, I didn't hear what you said. Why? Because they weren't listening. They were dull of hearing. The Bible makes it clear very clear in this passage of scripture that it was so bad that they in the dullness of heart they lost their capability of capability of teaching and they had to be taught again they had forgotten the things that once they had practiced the things that they had once done they quit performing those acts of righteousness. They began doing the wrong thing. They got out of church. They got away from God. Uh, they started doing the things that the world does and they lost their ability to teach others. And they said, you've got to be taught again. You used to eat steaks. Now you're not able to eat steaks. All you can do is drink milk. You can't even... You're just a babe now where before you were so strong in the Lord. Oh, do you realize how many people have become that way because of the dullness of hearing? Whenever I hear somebody say, nobody is going to tell me what to do, I often want to add to that, not even God. Because when we get to the place where we are no longer teachable, we are dull of hearing. And even though the Word of God is preached week in and week out, isn't it strange? All of you know this to be true. Your pastor gets up and preaches the Word of God week after week, month after month, year after year. And still people get away from God. Why is that? They're not listening. They're dull of hearing. Number four. Then they go from being dull of hearing to despising the things of God. 37 times we see the word despise in the Bible. Look with me in chapter 10, would you, of Hebrews verse 26. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. This verse is a verse that is scary really because People can come to the place where they begin to drift, doubt, they become dull of hearing, but then they go so far as to despise the Word of God. Notice what it says in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fierce indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised 
Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done, notice, despite unto the Spirit of grace. Wow! Those that have trodden underfoot the Son of God, they've stomped the work that Jesus did. They no longer appreciate what Jesus did for them. Why? Because they despise the truth of God's Word. The Bible says in verse 30, if you'll notice there, for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will repent, or recompense, saith the Lord. And then again, the Lord shall judge his people. I must say to you that God is going to judge those that despise his word. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. He is simply saying to us that if we slip, if we allow ourselves to become dull of a hearing, if we allow ourselves to begin doubting the things of God, then we will despise God. I've known people that have been extremely backslidden. I remember when I was a pastor, there were times that people would quit coming to church and then, man, they, they used to love the things of God, but then I'd go by to see them and they'd open the door, but they wouldn't let me in, Pastor. What do you want? We're not coming back. And they'd slam the door. It's like I would see them in the grocery store. You know, my wife and I, we'd go to the grocery store together and I nev it never worked out good for me to shop with my wife because I'd meet people that I knew and we'd start talking and she'd say, oh, forget him, he's, he's talking to people. But I've literally had people run away when they saw me come into the store. Isn't that nuts? I mean, so I would, I would see which aisle they were on and they saw me and they, they ran. And so I would, I would uh, work, work over toward them and then I'd get closer to them and before you know, I'd, I'd come right up to them. How you doing? I, I wanted them to know that they despised God. They were despising me because they didn't want to see me, but they really weren't despising me. I love them. And God loves them, but they were despising God. They were living a lifestyle that they knew was wrong, and yet they went that way anyway. You say, were they really saved? Well, some of them may be. I think some of them not. It is so sad when you see people that have gone that way. That brings me to number five. Number five. This is the saddest one of all. I honestly believe that a person could drift, a person could doubt, a person could become dull of hearing, maybe a person could despise, but the last one I don't think this person really knows the Lord, and that is to defy, to defy the Lord, or to deny that they even know Him. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12 in closing. Hebrews chapter 12. Here we find people that defied the Lord. Go with me to verse 14, would you? In chapter 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently... Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let's move along to verse. Let's move along to, to uh, verse uh, 
16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not coming to the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and, temp and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voices they that hear entreat that the word should not be spoken of them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then spoke the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, of, as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we received receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace thereby, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Notice the last verse. For our God is a consuming fire. What am I trying to say to you this evening? I'm trying to say to all of you here that it's a very dangerous thing to get away from God. It all begins by drifting. It goes from drifting on to doubting. From doubting to dullness of hearing then despising, and then ultimately defying God Almighty. I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. And I fear that if something doesn't happen by the time this coronavirus ends, we may not see a moving back to God. The debauchery and the wickedness of this world is astronomical. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And what's real sad is when Christians love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Another passage, it says, they're lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. We expect that of the lost people, but what happens when a Christian becomes a lover of pleasure more than he's a lover of God? The Bible also says they're ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. He goes on to say they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. There's such a thing as religion. But the truth is, is what we need is a relationship. A relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to get so consumed with the desire to please God that we would not want any of these five things to enter into our life that would defile us or that would discourage us or that would defeat us or that would cause us to lose spiritual ground. Where are the 
spiritual giants anymore. Where are the spiritual statesmen anymore? Where are the people that walk with God and live a holy life? Don't you crave it? I've read books by Ian Bounds and Leonard Ravenhill, and as I'm reading them, I'm like, oh, I've fallen so short of what God really desires for me to be. It's so convicting. That's the greatest thing that could ever happen is when your heart is convicted. When you say, oh man, I need to change some things in my life. I need to repent of some things that I've allowed into my life that I know shouldn't be there. Just because other Christians may not be right with God, what right do we have not to be right? And oh, may we come to the place in our lives where we devour the Word of God, where we drink of the Word of God, where we, we spend time fellowshipping with God. Oh, listen, this world is no home for the Christian, ultimately. This is not our home. We're just passing through. Amen? Amen. That's why he said live in the heavenlies. <laughs> we're walking down here, but we're living up there. And God knows when we're walking with him, doesn't he? You know, Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Can you imagine that? He's walking along, fellowshipping with the Lord. and I, I don't know how the Lord went about it. That's one of the questions I have I want answered. How did it happen? I can just hear him saying, well, we were walking along and the Lord said, you know, it's a lot closer to my place than your place. And Enoch goes, yeah, you're right. And all of a sudden, they're translated right up into, the, into glory. Hey, one of these days it's going to happen. Amen? Amen. Our dear, our dear preacher and friend, Brother Brewster, graduated. The Lord took him to glory. Yes, we'll miss him, but who would wish him back? My dear mother went to heaven. Who would wish her back? Knowing that she's in the throne room of God and fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus and all of the wonderful things that are going to happen. Why would we live ungodly in an ungodly world? Why don't we live godly in an ungodly world? And may God use all of us to reach this generation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. May we, our Heavenly Father, we need a touch from heaven. We need you to come down by the power of your Spirit to convict us of any sin, any doubting, any drifting, any dullness of hearing, any despising. Oh God, I pray that we would never defy you. But Lord, may we serve you. May we drink of the truth of your Word. May we walk in your presence there is fullness of joy at that right hand there are pleasures forevermore give us a hunger and a thirst for you help us to stop doing unimportant things and start doing important things may we stop doing unrighteousness and start doing righteous things oh god may we live with the power of true revival do a great work in our lives we pray in Christ's name, amen. Amen. I'm glad you guys agree with that. You know, we're going to play an invitation song right now. It's called, Lord, I'm Coming Home. And uh, really the title of this message is a consequences of not turning yourself. You're going to surely die or surely live. Would you come home to Him? Is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Are you scared tonight? Do you have some godly fear about what direction you're going? Some of you can't pray. Some of you don't read your Bible. Some of you are not interested in spiritual things. They're just You're just not there. Some of you may not be saved and born again. Are you fearful that you can be in the hands of an angry God? For God is a consuming fire. Oh, would you come home tonight to Him? Just come home. Listen to the word. Listen to the, is there any words in this song? Just the music? Do you know the words? Brother Chuck's going to sing some of these words. Best ones he, the ones he can sing. As he's singing these songs, I want you to pray in your heart. Bow your heads. Look 
God in the eyes of your heart and say, Lord, if there's anything that I'm not right with you, help me to turn myself tonight towards you. Listen as he sings this song. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming. In coronavirus and after coronavirus. Where are we going to be, Galilean Baptist Church, in a few weeks? Are we going to be on fire, right with God, tuned up, in harmony, in unity with the God of heaven? Are we going to end this thing and come on this down a little time and say, you know what, I'm the same person I used to be. And I'm not a teacher. I can't be a teacher. No, this church, if, if anything this church needs, it needs Sunday school teachers. That's what we're lacking most right now at Galilean Baptist Church. People who are willing and able to teach others also. We've got to reach and teach people. Who does those type things? Those who are right with the Lord. Those who are ready to go and are called upon to do it and says, hey, yes, I will teach boys and girls. I will teach young people. I will teach a ladies class. I'll teach a men's class. I'll teach a new members class. I'll teach people. I'll reach people and teach them. I don't know about you. That's a great need that we have. And may God help us these next couple weeks and days as we're getting serious about living the Christian life and getting right with God about some things. We feel this judgment of God, the consequences of not turning ourselves. We'll be ready to get right with the Lord these days and to come back on fire for the Lord. That's what revival is. Living again. Living again. And may God bring us to that place and bless us. Well, this has been a great day. A great day. Some of you may be burdened right now for somebody in your family who's away from the Lord. Maybe a son, a daughter, an uncle, an aunt, a mom or a dad, uh, a brother or sister, a member of our church that you're concerned about. May God help us to get on our face and get right with God ourselves and pray that God will begin a work in their lives and that they'll be burdened to live for the Lord. May God bring them in, right? We sang it this morning. Bringing them in from the field of sin. 
May God help us. Listen, it's been a great day today. Two services. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. And know that God wants to do work in my life and your life. But let's let Him do it. Amen. Let's just open our hearts up and let Him do a work in our lives. And that would be great. Brother Ross, why don't you come up here real quick and dismiss us in prayer. And uh, just ask God to send us on our way safely and just speak to our hearts. Would you pray for us, please? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, uh, please forgive us our sins and uh, help us examine ourselves and help us be mindful of the word that was preached today. Uh, that we don't drift away from doubt or harden our hearts or despise your word or God forbid defy. Uh, Lord, help us do that which is right in your sight and uh, stay the course, Lord. And uh, please thank you uh, and protect Brother Mickerbocker, Brother Wilkerson, Brother Hogger, and everyone here, Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Be careful pulling out now, okay? It's been a great day. Thank you.